There's a quote from Fraser that I've always loved. What's the one thing better than an exquisite meal? An exquisite meal with one tiny flaw we can pick at all night. <laughs> the idea that the only thing better than something perfect is something that would have been perfect, aside from a single flaw you get to enjoy complaining about, has stuck with me for years. And it came to mind when I watched Pixar's Coco a few years ago. Coco is a phenomenal movie. The incredibly vibrant visuals and world building. The intense sadness of its story. The fantastic music and the heavy lean into Latin culture, especially surrounding their concepts of death and posthumous memory. It's a perfect movie. Except for one wee moment near the end. After Mama Coco secures her memories of Hector, cementing his place on the family of Frenda and existence in the afterlife, he's reunited with his daughter there. But she's an old woman. And he's still a young man. The joy of the moment aside, you need to admit that seeing your kid older than you would be a wee bit horrific. I guess you'd get used to that living in the afterlife, but watching the movie while you're still alive makes it a bit weird. Despite how this might sound, I'm not criticising the movie. I don't think they should have taken this bit out, or made Coco appear to Hector as a wee girl again or anything. I actually like it when a movie has one scene or moment that stands out like this, that's uncharacteristically strange, or even just a bit shite. I like that. This came to mind when I recently watched Junta Yamaguchi's Beyond the Infinite Two Minutes, wherein a Japanese cafe owner realises that his PC monitor upstairs shows the cafe downstairs two minutes in the future, and the TV in the cafe downstairs shows the bedroom upstairs two minutes in the past. Things get a bit hectic when his mates create a feedback loop with the screens, allowing them to see four, six, eight, ten, twelve minutes into the future, leading to an intervention by the Time and Space Bureau. These two goofy bastards with ray guns that jump back in time to put a stop to the shenanigans. Aside from the understated see in the future concept, this is the first and only part of the film that feels outwardly futuristic or sci-fi, and this scene picks such a weird time to happen. It's right between the close of the climax when the danger is over, and the denouement where the hero and his love interest finally get a chance to get to know each other. So why is it here? It adds nothing and has no consequence. Well, probably because it's funny. It's there because Yamaguchi wanted it to be there. He wanted to have a moment where these guys fade away in a panic because of the actions of the people meddling with time. And if he wants it to be there, why shouldn't it be? Films, games, songs, they're always at their most captivating when they're as close to the original intention and worldview of a creator or small group of creators as possible. I've talked about this before on the channel, but this exact thing is part of the reason why I'm such a big fan of manga. I feel like more than any other artistic industry, it involves the least compromise. For example, one of my favourite series, Gantz, is chock full of mad shit that writer Hiroya Oku clearly never felt he had to justify to anybody. Dopey wee androids singing Daniel Boone songs that blow the eyes right out of your head if you upset them. An omniscient god alien that changes faces between Hitler, Michael Jackson, Louis Armstrong and more that makes you cry blood when you see it. And whatever the fuck these things are. All kinds of mad designs held back and informed by nothing but sheer, unrestrained creative potential. Brutal and detailed and bizarre. But not quite bizarre enough to stop some characters in Gantz from shagging them. There's a lot of weird sex stuff in Gantz, not to mention Oku's other work. And while this is never something that's going to sell me on a series, you know, I don't go looking for this shit, there is a backwards kind of positive to seeing a creator jam their fetish into their work. Because more than anything else, that's the clearest signal that nobody could tell them what not to put into their work. Everything they wanted to show up in the story is there, whether it was wise or not to jam it in. It's pure stream of consciousness. And I'm not trying to say that Coco's weird wee moment like this was some kind of deliberate stand for autourism in film. It's probably just something that wasn't given enough thought at the time. Or maybe I'm the only one that found it a bit uncomfortable. But I'm glad it is there, even if I think it shouldn't be.